this grew out of a short you made, right? That's right. And yeah. what was that process like? How did that short get into the hands of whoever was going to say, you know, make this a feature? Well, the short uh, we made the short in 2005 um, for like 1500 bucks. Um, and it was one guy alone in the room with the mirror and a couple cameras. Uh, and it played some middle tier film festivals and the fans seemed to really like it. Um, so there was interest immediately in expanding it into a feature. Uh, but everybody, because there were cameras in the room, was like, found footage. And kind of everywhere that it would go, be like, we could do this low budget found footage. And I was like, no, I'd, I'd really rather do something else. Um, so for years, it kind of sat in a drawer. Um, and I went off and did another movie. and. Uh, started to get more meetings around town and, and uh, had a meeting with Intrepid Pictures in uh, 2011. Um, and this was, the feature expansion for Oculus was the last thing I mentioned on a list of like five other projects. And they were like, oh, great, let's, let's look at that. Um, so they were really excited to come in and do it, you know, do it in a different way and, and not kind of fall back on the, the found footage angle. And we developed the script together very quickly in 2011. Um, we had had a, a very short outline that was kind of uh, just detailing the, the sibling relationship and dealing with the, the parallel storylines. And um, from there, we, we grew the script very fast, and the next next summer we were prepping the feature. Was there any trial and error with expanding the, expanding the script? Did you ever yes. like come across storylines that you thought could work, and then you're like, eh, let's abandon this? Absolutely. It was tricky because the short's you know, just the one guy in the room, so it was like, how do you, how do you expand that in a way that keeps that sense of claustrophobia and dread? but how do you hang a movie on one guy? Um, and so we played around with a couple ideas, but I think the least successful being an anthology movie where it was gonna be three little half hour stories. And- um, Well, now that you bring that up, I kind of watched that. Yeah, oh, I think there's room for that now, like now that kind of the, the foundation's laid for it. Um, but it was really tricky at the time because it was like, it, it felt very disjointed and I really wanted there to be some kind of connective tissue to pull them all together other than the mirror itself. Um, so, ultimately, what what worked was just doing a true expansion of the short in a way. Uh, in the short, he references what happens, uh, what happened when he was a kid, um, but you never see it. And so it was like, well, there's our two stories, and if we can just, you know, grow those together and have them kind of, you know, wrap around each other like vines, like that. That seemed like the coolest structure to me. Where did this idea of the mirror come from? Like to begin with, even from the short. Well, I, I've always thought mirrors are really creepy. Because you know our our entire self image you know that we have of ourselves is is from the mirror, but it's it's wrong. It's like first it's backwards, and then every mirror is slightly imperfect. Like the glass is always a little warped. Like we never really understand reality, but we all assume that that's what we're seeing when we look into it. Um, I love the uh, uh, the Jewish tradition of covering mirrors at funerals to prevent you know prevent the spirits from coming back into the world. And kind of those two things together made it like, well, if we do this right, it's, it turns the mirror into kind of a portable overlook hotel that we can carry around and hang anywhere. Um, so that's, that's what it, where it came from. And um, because it's really, you know, it's difficult to convince people that, that an inanimate object can be scary. You know, uh, it, it was also fun just for the challenge of it. You know, um, it, it also poses a lot of production challenges because the, the thing about shooting against a reflective surface is it really, you know, very quickly, especially when so large, uh, means that, you know, you're in the room and you're going to be looking at your crew, you're going to be looking at, you know, the equipment. That actually didn't cross my mind for a second. Normally I'm kind of obsessed with looking at people wearing glasses and looking for reflections in that. Yeah. I'm surprised because I didn't spot that for a second here. We had to we had to go through great lengths actually to make that the case because we didn't have the budget to just go in. And, and I also wouldn't have wanted to go in and just do it all digitally, you know. Um, so we actually had this mirror that had the, the glass itself was on a gimbal and it could be just slightly angled um, away so we could kind of go back and adjust it and frame things out, uh, which is neat because every time you look at the mirror in the movie, it's not reflecting what it should be, um, which is something else I really loved for us thematically. And it's, I mean, it's so subtle, nobody's ever really gonna pick up on it, but you know, if you're staring straight at it, it's reflecting kind of just off to the side. And I, I loved that for it. It was like, just everything's wrong about this reflection. What's it like putting your cast and crew in that room? Are people like hiding in corners or are you watching just, everyone is watching on a monitor somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, um, the the hero room that the mirror hangs in in, in the movie was uh, the one room that we built um, on a stage so that we could fly walls out. And, and um, you know, uh, the cast, you know, 
had a lot to deal with because there are also live cameras in the room. So if they weren't being caught in the reflection, they would certainly be caught in what was happening with the video cameras in the story. And the monitors were live, and, and so the crew had to get really, you know, kind of far away from the action so that we wouldn't force the cast to have to break it up into tiny little bits and let them kind of perform it properly. You give yourself quite the challenge here, and it's not just with this, it's with the story too, because yeah. it's kind of like in a similar way, the younger versions of the characters and the older version are overlapping. Yeah. What made you want to have to do that? Because there's a lot of pieces, because it's not just completely separate. You could have gone linear and you didn't. They're crossing over, and then you have the two characters interacting, the, the same version. Yeah in like one scene. Yeah, no, I, 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 I love that stuff. It, it is uh, more challenging, certainly, and uh, you know, the actors initially kind of had to wrap their heads around it, that it was like, you know, that they'd actually be sharing a frame with kind of the younger versions. Um, that stuff, you know, for me, I had a, a background as an editor um, before, before everything kind of started to, to work um, as, a, as a director. And uh, so I always kind of approach a project as an editor first, and that for me just seemed like so much fun and um, way more complicated for production, but you know, at the end I think really worth it because it's, it's, not, it's not a typical way to, to tell a story or to tell a flashback kind of structure. Was there any concern that when you see the older and younger version of the character in a scene at the same time that like, the audience might not totally get it in terms of like, where that is actually happening in the span of time? Yeah, th there was concern for sure and, and you know, kind of fighting against this idea that we never wanted the movie to get confusing in a negative way. We never wanted it to be confusing in a way that would pull somebody out. But we definitely wanted it to be disorienting, and it was like you know if we can find if we can find a way to kind of straddle that line and present the material in a way that's like it's unsettling, it's messing with reality and distorting it um, without pulling somebody out of the experience. Like that that was the goal, and you know I I, I think because the cast was so um, so behind it in in dealing with you know in dealing with those transitions and dealing with particularly the younger and older versions of the same character, you know, I, I think we pulled it off. How was it pulling your cast together? Was it offers that just went out and you knew who you wanted? Um, well, I wanted Karen Gillan from the very beginning. I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. Um, and, you know, Kaylee's kind of a, a hopefully, a, a unique uh, heroine in a movie like this because she's very prepared for, for the monster. You know, she's, um, she's really brave, she's very determined, she's very smart, she's very calculating, and, and that was something from watching Karen on Doctor Who and what she did with Amy Pond, that it was like, that's, that's gonna be you know, what we want. Um, so Karen was always the, the first choice, and uh, we were you know, just thrilled that it, that it worked out. Um, and then uh, a lot of the other casting, um, people submitted tapes, we did auditions. Uh, Annalise Basso, who plays young Kaylee, put herself on tape and just sent us this 90 second tape. Those kids, amazing. you got the right ones there. Yeah, I, I, and with actors like that, I mean, the, the victory is just in, in casting them. And then it's, you know, with Annalise and Garrett, it was like, just get out of their way because they, they know what they're doing. Like, um, the, I'd love to take some credit for what they did, but it's like, my job is really just to kind of put them in place and, you know, and step back and let them do what they do. Um, they were so good. and. We saw Annalise's tape and we're just like, we're done, that's it, that's her. Um, Brenton Thwaites came in and auditioned for Tim um, and really, really blew us away in his audition. Um, Katie Sackoff, I'm a big Battlestar fan, so it was the minute her name kind of came up as a possibility and we knew she was available, it was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, Starbuck. Um, so uh, so Katie, uh, Katie came on um, mostly out of you know, our enthusiasm for her and, and she loved the script. And then Rory was the, the last actor to come on the project. He came on very late. Um, I think he had uh, only a couple of days to kind of prepare and, and get into it. And I love him going back to Empire Records. So um, it was just, it was like, I've never seen him do something like this. He's so. almost unrecognizable in this. And I yeah. have a slight obsession with Empire Records. Yeah, it's a great movie, right? And, and it's so funny because um, I was like, no, people, it's like we're going to see a very different side of Rory. We're going to see a completely different side of Katie Sackhoff. It's like, how are people going to really react to that? Um, and Rory, you know, came at it with a very, because it's so easy in a, in a character who's kind of got a trajectory of madness, you know, it's so easy to kind of go 
over the top and crazy, and Rory likes to pull everything in and kind of keep it all just burning inside. So it's a very subtle performance, and I think it's one of his best. I love what he, what he did with it. Did you just commit to this whole group, or was there any kind of chemistry testing beforehand? Because they work together so well. Is that just a stroke of luck? Um, well, I mean, we were we were really confident in the cast, you know, as, as they came together. Um, we were fortunate in that the, the adults were able to interact with the kids a lot prior to production. And uh, one of the things Karen, Karen can talk about it better than I can, um, was that it was like they, they would want to study what the kids were doing to create the character to make sure that they were going to be doing the same. And, you know, kind of collaborating on a character uh, between two actors instead of kind of sending them off on their way. So uh, we, there is always an element of luck when you bring people together on a project. And we certainly were very lucky in a lot of respects on this project. Um, but uh, the chemistry between, uh, between the cast is one of those things that, that you know, yes, we were lucky, but it, it also is a testament to their professionalism and, and their approach to the characters. You didn't get to shoot in order, did you? Oh, God, I wish. Uh, no, we did not shoot in order. Um, we didn't shoot in anything, anything <laughs> resembling order. And so um, continuity for, for us, uh, making sure that the movie was structured right, was one challenge, and for the actors to to try to pull off what's already a really complicated arc, um, additionally out of sequence was so hard. How do and you approach that as an actor's director? Do you do you have to like sit them down before you shoot a scene and be like, this and this and this has to happen now because yes. this is where we are in the script. Well, we um, one of the things that we were able to do was spend an awful lot of time together and prep, going through the script and mapping the arc together. Um, but yeah. We all had to spend a lot of effort to like make sure that we were concentrating and, and knew exactly where we were in these various arcs. Um, it was really it's a very difficult juggling act, but you know once again we, we were lucky to have a wonderful cast to, to pull that off because it could have it could have gone south in any number of a thousand ways so. And how about directing your actors in terms of delivering exposition? Because I was kind of blown away by how she just stands there in front of the camera, literally explains, I mean, that had to have been going on for 15 minutes, but yeah. I was totally absorbed and compelled by all the information. What kind of direction do you give her when she's standing there doing that? Uh, that was, I think, the single sequence that we were the most concerned about going into it. Um, and uh, for Karen, I mean, she'll say that it was, when she read the script, it was for her, like, this is why she wanted to do it, was because she got to have this huge, you know, huge monologue. Um, it's really challenging because uh, it is just a lot of information. Um, but uh, for directing, I mean, what we did with it um, was uh, talked a lot about campfire stories. And it was like, if we can do this right in the way that you sit there and, and hear a really fantastic ghost story, you know, this is several in a row. And it's like, if you can just tell it matter of factly, you know, don't try to, don't try to throw, throw more into it than is necessary. Let the information kind of do its job. Um, and for Karen, she had to just know that entire monologue from beginning to end and be able to jump into it at any point, depending on the angle. I think we spent two days shooting that scene, which is more ask. than we spent on anything else. Um, so yeah, I mean, she, she was a, a champ on that. I think she can still, to this day, like probably recite that entire thing. I'm gonna go quiz her after. You should. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, that was one of the elements of the short film that kind of came over almost verbatim. And we knew it was possible for it to work because it worked in the short, um, but it's, it's really tough. And I think there was a lot of, there were a lot of nerves going in of just like, are we really gonna be able to sustain interest in this for so long? Um, but that all hinges on the actor. And you know, for Karen, it was just like, bring, bring your authority, bring the sense that you're enjoying presenting this information and just tell us a great story and we'll be fine. How about the transformation that happens when you're the victim of the mirror? Is there anything about that design that you wanted to speak to certain elements of what the mirror is trying to achieve? Yeah, uh, one of the things that's really kind of cool about it is that um, I, when people see the trailer online, it's like people will say things about like, oh, there's you know someone with glowing eyes. And it's like when you really look at it, it's actually mirrored glass, um, and there are active reflections happening there. Um, I loved the idea that it's like the mirror consumes somebody so completely that what we see of them is just the suit that it puts on. It's, there's nothing left but the skin. And um, so we, uh, it was actually our most complicated effect in the movie, was creating those eyes um, and allowing them to, to actively reflect everything else that was happening around it. Um, so it's like if, if you know, the eyes are truly the window to the soul, and you're looking in them and it's just reflecting yourself back out. It's like, it's not only empty, it's, it's deflective. And I thought that was really creepy. I like that idea. Yeah. And now, 
you've got this coming out and I have a feeling it's going to be received really well so more opportunities to come what's next I know you have a couple things that could possibly take off that sound very interesting oh yeah well we uh, uh, just finished um, a movie called Somnia um, which is uh, Trevor Macy who produced uh, Oculus produced that as well um, and that's a really beautiful horror movie. Um, I'm really excited about that one. It's very, very emotional, very different. And uh, we just announced we're going to do uh, another project together called Diver. Um, that's really, really cool. It's uh, I think it's it's the darkest of anything that I've worked on. That's the and, cop one, right? Yeah. It's it's kind of this. Uh, like I think horror fans will grab onto it. It's it's a much it's it's broader than a horror movie. It's got a lot more going on. Um, but it does have horror elements, and I think you know people that get excited about like Flatliners and Angel Heart and throw in some Inception in there. It's like it's going to be a really kind of exciting, exciting thrill ride movie, and I'm really excited to get into that. We do that this summer.